Welcome everybody. Um, this is the second of our series of uh, theological reflections for Lent 2023. And I'm going to be talking about using this Kairos moment and exploring ourselves as agents of change. I'm going to divide the talk into three parts. So first, I'm going to talk about the concept of Kairos, and then I'm going to look at some of the scriptural accounts of Kairos. And then I'm going to look into some of the ways that we might respond as activists. So Kairos is one of two Greek words that's used for time in scripture. And the more familiar concept, I guess, for us is Kronos, which is sequential time that we use every day. It's the time that we calculate by physics and the Earth's passage around the sun, uh, the chronology of the passing hours and days and weeks and years. By contrast, in ancient Greek literature, Kairos was the time of opportunity, calling for decisive action and courageous action. And dictionaries of ancient Greek kind of give the meaning in terms of a due time or a time when things are brought to crisis. It's a sort of decisive epoch that uh, is the opportune or the right time, the time that's waited for. And Kairos moments are not measured by minutes or hours, but by what is happening. It's a sort of, I guess, in opposition to the chrono chronological understanding of temporality of time, which is generally horizontal and based on duration and maybe even a continuation of the now or the looking back from the now, Kairos can be thought of quite helpfully as a, a vertical, a discontinuous. It, it can't be measured at all since it occurs only at the moment. And even all those moments put together, they can't be measured in the same way as chronological time. I, I find it quite helpful sometimes to frame Kronos time as how we measure our days and our lives quantitatively and to frame Kairos as the qualitative experience of time. And Kairos has a particular meaning and place in Christian life. So Strong's Greek lexicon records the word being used about 86 times in the New Testament in different ways. But generally speaking to a specific God ordained time, sometimes called the right time or the appointed season. And Kairos is God's dimension. You might look at it as the intersection of chronological time with God's eternity. This, this sort of godly Kairos, it pierces its way into creation into our world at just the right time and in doing so it sort of slices through Kronos and I think the incarnation of God in human form in Galilee 2,000 years ago is one of the biggest examples I can think of of that but it, it also operates in myriad tiny ways too and, and in that way it's very relevant to how we conduct ourselves. So Kairos doesn't have to be an instant for us. It, it could be a, a short window of time, like an immediate fleeting second, or it could be a longer window of time, as in, say, harvest time. And it's important to, to bear in mind that we talk about the Kronos moment, sorry, the Kairos moment, but actually that moment is not like a second in time. And in those sorts of examples, uh, like the second or the harvest time, you know, the very short to the very long, Kairos is a sort of time where you need to get moving. You know, the crops need to be harvested. It's the appointed time, the proper time, maybe the slice of time where you have an opportunity. And that's important because that opportunity, that Kairos is going to eventually slip away. And it's important that we recognize that there's a time to act on it. So having set some terms of reference for Kairos, I think it might be helpful to explore 
a few of the biblical references, ones that I think might be sort of particularly helpful. So let's start with Mark uh, 1, verses 14 and 15. Yeah. The time has come, the time. So the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. It's not just any time, but the time. God's appointed hour for the word to be shared through Jesus. And the NIV study Bible calls this use of Kairos not simply chronological time, but the, de the sort of decisive time for God's action. And noting, you know, kind of Mark's not interested in telling us when precisely this occurred on the human calendar. The thing that counts for him is the time seen from the divine side. This kairos is a special time, the chosen time, it's powerful and right and fixed by God and to be used for God's purposes. And then we have Galatians 6, 9, which says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So it's that proper time. Maybe we need to wait for it. Maybe we need to look for it. But there's a proper time for action, for harvest, for whatever we do to act in the world. I want to turn to also to Ephesians 5, um, 15 and 16, because it touches on an important part of Kairos. And I'm going to look firstly at the King James uh, Version which says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So it's redeeming the time. And, and actually, you can see uh, how this operates in, in the NIV, because it says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So making the most of every opportunity. But that word redeeming from the King James Version is quite interesting. We see the same phrase in the uh, King James uh, Version of Colossians 4, um, 4, 5. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. And I think it's interesting because redeeming our kairos is not about being passive. Redeeming is uh, paying for, buying back. Um, it's very proactive. And in fact, being proactive is how we redeem our kairos. It's how we make the most of every fleeting second that we have. So there's a sense in which our time, our chronos, presents us with opportunities but the opportunities are made kairos by our being proactive. I think a kairos moment is an invitation to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in that moment. A kairos moment occurs when it's God's time to act in human affairs, but the Holy Spirit is present and moving in a person, in a situation, or in a group to accomplish some specific work for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So maybe it might be helpful to think that Kairos is a time when God seeks to interrupt our routine in order that we can do God's work. And it might be a time that touches us so deeply that we're changed forever. It's a sort of key word used to describe Jesus's ministry, which changes us forever. But it might be an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God in, in a way that seems smaller. But of course, God uses all these moments, these kairos moments, to God's own purpose. Now, Jesus's ministry was filled with these kairos moments. And here are a few examples. Um, Jesus called Zacchaeus down from the sycamore tree. And this resulted in Zacchaeus turning his life round, and no doubt also turning around the lives of those he made reparation to. So that, that sort of kairos moment 
has many ramifications that we don't always see in that immediate instant. So Jesus heard the cries of the blind Bartimaeus, and that was the blind man's Kairos's, Kairos moment. The woman with the issue of blood crept up to Jesus and touched his robe, and it was her opportune moment. And there's a great example in Matthew 12, 2, which says, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. So at the right time, Jesus went through the Sabbath day on the corn and his disciples were hungry and they began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat it. It was a right time to challenge the traditional Sabbath laws, to break conventional norms, to break laws. And this might speak very importantly to people who are in a movement that espouses this civil resistance and civil disobedience as a way to respond to the grace crisis that we're in, because it's about breaking those traditional laws, but at the right time. And we, I'm gonna say a bit more about how that might work later, but I just want to, to, to say this before I do. We use our chronos time very busily because it's really important that we make good use of that. The Bible is really clear that we should use the talents and the time that is given to us and we should use it productively. But we need to be careful because the risk is that we will miss the kairos opportunities within that. And a moment lost is an opportunity gone forever. So there's a parable, I think, that, that helps me when I look at this. And it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And parables have many, many layers. They, they bear coming back to and unwrapping time and time again. But one of those layers is the two religious leaders. They saw a wounded man beaten and bleeding and left to die. Maybe that was their Kairos moment, but they failed to take it. They failed to help. They were so preoccupied with their journey, the getting from A to B, what they were doing in the world at that time, that they missed the opportunity to minister to an injured man. And we forget sometimes that time and opportunity, Kronos, are a gift from God, but Kairos is also a gift from God and both are to be used for God's glory. And we have to give an account of how we use that when our time on this earth is up. So we need to be ready for the Kairos moment. And there are some helpful pointers, I think, in the New Testament as to how that Kairos might work for us. So if we look at Luke 12, um, 54 to 56, we need to have a capacity to read the signs of the times. Kairos is a time that requires interpretation. So maybe we need to upskill ourselves in what the times look like so that we can see the signs of the times. And in Luke 19, 44, we, we hear again, it's critical to recognize it. I've touched on this, but it's really important that this says, if you allow it to pass, the loss will be immeasurable. How important is that for the time in which we live? Uh, if we don't take these Kairos moments, the loss to not just us, uh, but to the whole of humanity could be immeasurable. When we have Romans 13, the Kairos time is here, you know, it, it's with us now, and it calls for action and conversion and transformation, a change of life. I think really importantly, there's also sort of the message that comes from 11 Corinthians, um, sorry, from Corinthians 6, um, verses 1 and 2, and, and it reminds us that Kairos is not just crisis, but opportunity and favor, and that God will assist us in discerning the Kairos. It's a, it's a moment of grace. And Kairos comes, I think, 
at that moment of choice for God and for us. And I think that our time, this socio-political moment, is a time of crisis and opportunity. It's a now that we will find our Kairos. And it's a real privilege in some ways for us to be able to be born in this time, to be able to act in this time of crisis and opportunity. We have the blessing of being in the right place at the right time. And I think one of the reasons that this is at the right place, the right time for us is we're all really familiar with climate tipping points that will lead to runaway climate change. And we talk about this, we talk a lot about it. But it's important to remember that a tipping point is the one small step that can lead to a giant leap forward. And that could be us. We could be at the point of transformation that society needs. But the climate crisis has brought us a time to think about how we as humanity live in right relationship with God and how we may have lost our way in that. So these Kairos moment that's been given to us is both a challenge, but a real opportunity to do the work of God. And 2 Corinthians 6 seems to me to somewhat reflect the situation that activists find themselves. So I'm going to spend a little time actually reading through it because I think it's really helpful if we take this into our hearts. So verses one and two say, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. So in the time, um, there was a kairos there, but it continues about the contrasting time that people found themselves in when the letter was being written. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so our ministry will not be discredited. And here we go. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings and imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, and in purity and in understanding, in patience and in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknowing, as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. So where does what I've said about those biblical notions of Kairos, where does everything I've said so far take us? I'm going to suggest that we can start by identifying parts of stepping into a Kairos moment. And I think there are probably three that we can draw from the scriptural narrative and from what's said about Kairos. So the first is listening to God allowing the spirit to be active within the situation and seeing the Kairos space. And I think the second is responding by allowing God's purpose to be discerned and spoken and acted through us. And the third is allowing God's purpose to be met in the hearts of those who hear and who see. And I'm going to suggest next that as part of our really wonderful CCA community, our faithful response to our context, to our Kairos moment, is to be 
effective activists. I think that's what CCA is called to do, to be a community of effective activists. Uh, taking a step back in a way from uh, our consideration of the scriptures and scriptural uh, prescriptions about Kairos, I want to look at some research around social movements because there's research that suggests that there are four roles that we need to enter into to be effective activists. And I think we can map those onto the three parts that I've talked about that, that scripture leads us to. So the sort of secular work suggests that activists need first to be seen by the public as people of integrity. So in order for social justice movements to succeed, activists must demonstrate to the majority of ordinary people that they are good people, that they're to be trusted. And consequently, or, or perhaps we could say that one way that effective activists demonstrate this is that they identify and work with the fundamental principles and the values and symbols of good in society, because these are accepted by the general public and we can, that there are common ground, so to speak, that we can build on. But we need to be kind of working and be with people in all the other common good of society. But at the same time, activists must be rebels who are prepared to say a loud no and who are prepared to protest the social conditions and the institutional policies and the practices that violate the core moral values and principles. And so the enormous harm of climate change is one of those that we need to speak very loudly to. And the third is that activists need to be agents of change. So people who work to educate, to organize, to involve the general public, to actively oppose the present policies, the, the, the bad policies, the harmful policies, and to seek positive and constructive solutions and ways uh, to change the situation. And nonviolent direct action is an important tool that we in CCA use to do this, but it's important that we see that we do that for a purpose, and that purpose is to educate and organize and involve people and to make change. But I think it doesn't stop there because to be effective activists, we need to take that a step forward, a step further, a step forward. Once we've done that uh, and ongoing and alongside that, we as activists must also be reformers. So the research suggests that we need to work with official political and judicial structures and private and public institutions, because we must work to get that transformative change accepted as the conventional wisdom of mainstream society. So not only do we need to work at a grassroots level, but we also need to work with those that hold power, because it's in those ways that we will bring about the change that we seek. So just bringing that down to the level in which many of us operate where we have some influence, how do we do this on a practical level, say in our church communities? And I'm gonna offer four suggestions, okay, that might help us to, to do this within our own lives. So the first is to tend to ourselves. We need to renew our own spiritual practices in the light of the current crisis. And we need to allow our renewed spiritual practice to work a metanoia, a change in our hearts and our minds and our daily habits. And this is an ongoing work. It doesn't stop when you think, oh, yes, I've seen the light. We need to keep doing this and to practice this, this, this metanoia, this change in it how who we are really and then we have to share that with other people 
So I think one of the ways that we can do that is to be really brave and persistent in encouraging our church communities in eco-theological reflection uh, at every level. And one of the ways I think that's useful is to encourage whenever biblical texts come up or whenever discussions come up, we have this rereading through the lens of the climate crisis. Um, and we need to do this so that other Christians can also be open to the change, to the, to the metanoia, because that will be what brings them in as activists and, and agents of change. And activists simply means people who act for change. And I think there's a, an important area that we need to advocate in. We need to advocate for, advocate for gender and racial and intergeneral justice because that speaks to our core values and because the consequences of the climate crisis fall hardest on them. But this is an area in which we can speak to other Christians. It's, it's core to our common Christian values. And I think we can see our nonviolent direct action as an integral part of this advocacy. But there's more to it than that, as, I, as, as the social justice um, research suggests, we need then to also engage in the di in dialogue. So the fourth step is alongside that to engage in, in dialogue and build networks of change within all levels of society and all levels of our community. So within our churches, but then we need to take it out and we need to share it both with people who, 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 who share our commitment and with those who don't, with, you know, with government agencies, with business, with industry, with civil society, and to bring those uh, who, who have begun to uh, experience the conversion within our communities along with us in doing that. So I can see that I, the, the time is, is moving on, and I've been talking for quite a long time, but I want to finish up by talking a little bit more, uh, uh, talking a bit about where Kairos might fit with thinking about hope and then about the ways in which our actions might be a particular Kairos moment, our, our sort of CCA type actions, not our individual actions. It's probably relevant to our individual actions as well. So hope first. Across the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, I think we see a foundation of our hope in God's promise. So in the despair of the climate and ecological crisis, we can still say we truly hope because we know that God has promised not to abandon the earth. We hold on to God's promises of the covenant that's made with every living creature for all future generations. We know the power of the spirit to renew the face of the earth. But there is though a journey a necessary progression from God's promise through to its final fulfillment in which we must play our part. So, so that progression, that journey is a linear view that's really quite rooted in Kronos, in the passing of time. But within that rooting in Kronos, every moment is important, and that's why we play our part in it. And every moment can be a Kairos moment. Every one of those times becomes a space where that hope, that promise can be con can be fulfilled. So I think that's part of the relationship between hope and kairos. And I think they're really important relationships because our hope is rooted in this idea, not of linear time passing, because that can be very, very um, worrying and depressing in, the, in our current situation, but in the moment of kairos in, in that sort of time. And the hope that we proclaim does two things. 
that I think are reflected in those practical steps that I suggested earlier. Firstly, it empowers us to stand in opposition to the oppressive systems, those powers and dominions. And secondly, it motivates us to participate in the healing of creation. And for hope to exist, one has to live it. I read somewhere it's like music. For music to exist, one has to perform it. So it's for us to make that hope exist through this idea of the Kairos. So here's where I think that it, it, our actions can particularly be the, this Kairos. So I'm really interested in the way that this idea of Kairos operates in the arena of, of time and place and space more than just Kronos, which is really a, a, an operates in the arena of time. Uh, I think Kairos has more to it than that. It's, it's a space, it creates something. And there's some interesting academic work that has proposed that there's a space between two unlike things. And this has a direct bearing on, on what we do when, for instance, we're in vigil or we are praying as a prayer protest or an action outside uh, somewhere outside parliament or outside Javelin Global or somewhere very concerned with the climate crisis because what we're doing is these two unlike things like secular space and spiritual space or between the place where power is exercised and the cry of the earth is expressed. That is the space between two unlike things where we have the opportunity to bridge. And the opportunity to bridge such a gulf is a kairos. It's a mandate fulfilling a divine opportunity to bring those two together, to build that bridge. And there's a suggestion um, that we should be proactively building these spaces of suspension, these bridges, between the secular and, and, and the sacred, between uh, what's happening, the, the really uh, business as usual, and God's kingdom. And these are the bridges where God's time takes effect. And they're the bridges that, that, that are at the heart of what we do, really. So I'm kind of ending with a bit of a challenge here. And the challenge to everyone is to take up this idea in what we do as activists. Where do we build those bridges? Uh, and where do, we build, where do we build Kairos into what we do as activists? So that's it. Um, and thank you for listening to me at, at some length. Um, and we're, I hope, have an interesting discussion about that this next but also that we will take this away and continue this discussion.